This is Guy Ritchie. Let's get to know this British hooligan a little better. Cottage. We'll start from the beginning. In 1778, Guy's great-great-great-great-grandfather, Baron Edward Crofton III, was born. He was a distant relative of King Edward I himself. Just kidding. That's way too far back. Let's transport ourselves to the year that Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were killed. 1968 may not have been the best year for America, but in Great Britain on the 10th of September, a World War II veteran and his family, now known as the advertising agent John Ritchie and homemaker Amber Parkinson, welcomed another child into their family, Guy Stewart Ritchie. Five years later, the Vietnam War ended, and while Elton John's Crocodile Rock was playing, another John was leaving Amber, Tabitha, and Guy. However, Ms. Parkinson returned to her Mrs. status that very same year. Richie's father-in-law became Michael Layton, the 11th Baron of Lowton Park, whose grounds became the backdrop for the future director's childhood. From the moment the boy's feet first crossed the school threshold in 75, he was always in trouble. In primary school, he was teased, bullied, and beaten up but he put an end to that when he started taking karate at age seven. After that, he was the one doing the beating. The next eight years followed the typical storyline. Dyslexia, fights, cutting class, suspension, and later expulsion from school at 15 after he was caught selling drugs and was permanently expelled from Stanford School. Rumor has it he was also caught with a prostitute in the dorms, but Richie's father denied the claims and declared that there had been, in fact, two prostitutes. Guy did not return to school. Thanks to his father's connections, the teen started working as a delivery boy at a film studio. For a long time, he ran errands while working in television and advertising. That is when he realized what he wanted to do with his life. After watching the Western Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, he fell in love with cinema and realized that it was his calling to create films. <laughs> By age 27, Guy had earned the reputation of an energetic and ambitious guy. He was able to work his way up from delivery man to director of commercials and music videos. He made clips for bands like the Bucketheads, DJ Jaco, and while yes, they look funny now, they already foreshadowed the style of British cinema in the future. In 95, Richie invested his humble savings into a 20-minute short film called The Hard Case. I am an I am an this reel was like a long commercial showcasing the director's abilities. It was packed with every shooting and editing trick possible and was catered to producers whose attention Guy so badly wanted. But as time went on, no one seemed to notice. Then he decided to look for an idea with a written script, which he could adapt for the screen. But he couldn't find anything worthy. Because of his dyslexia, Richie had a hard time working with text, and for a long time did not consider writing something himself. However, after a year of searching, he decided to try and develop his ideas from the hard case and make them into something bigger. That was how the four friends who were trying to get rich on poker made it into his new work. They were based on his acquaintances who were often in trouble with the law. When he ran out of inspiration from his own experiences, he would turn on police chases on the news and get ideas from there. When mobs of youths went on the rampage, police reinforcements had to be drafted in from Berkshire. 26 arrests were eventually made after a catalogue of destruction. It took Richie roughly six months to write the first draft. He had been simultaneously looking for sponsors who were ready to invest in the project. In the time it took him to do that, he could have written four more drafts. A group of patrons appeared only after two years. Having watched The Hard Case, Sting's wife Trudy Styler became interested in Guy's work. But when she offered to meet with Richie for a read-through of his new work, she was shocked by the awkwardness with which Guy I presented his story. It wasn't an easy read. It was a very long, rambling screenplay with terrible typos and really poorly presented. Now, Trudy, you produced this film? I did, yes. Another person who was intrigued was the owner of the Hard Rock Cafe chain, Peter Morton, who heard of Richie thanks to his godson, Matthew Vaughn, 
Vaughn was studying film in Los Angeles, and when he got his hands on the young British hooligan script, he realized that it was his ticket to the movie Big Leagues. In my experience, you're supposed to take that opportunity if you stay. Matthew became the film's producer and helped guide and convince sponsors to invest seven million pounds into Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. With this gigantic budget, at least by amateur directing standards, Richie began to put together his acting ensemble. He had planned to fill it with British stars, but when it came time to shoot, many of the investors backed out, leaving Vaughn and Richie with roughly 700,000 uh, pounds. The whole thing about raising finances is it depends on who your cast is, and uh, we had no one in there. The amount was 10 times less, which immediately destroyed all casting plans. In hindsight, that setback gave Guy the best possible acting ensemble. For 17 of the actors, the picture became their debut. The first to join the film was Vinny Jones. Business good. I imagine that's why I'm here. Guy had predicted Vinny's debut while writing the script. The description of Big Chris could be summed up in one line. Looks like English footballer Vinny Jones. There was another newbie among the four central roles. While walking around London, Richie noticed a young man selling bits and bobs on the street. His charisma and eloquence earned Jason Statham a main role, not to mention an amazing career. Of course, worth separate mention is Sting's appearance thanks only to his wife, Trudy Styler, who convinced him. The minimized budget scared her as one of the producers, and the appearance of a famous star was one way to provide the film with badly needed publicity. And uh, he jumped on board. We paid him. We paid him quite a lot. I think we paid him about 25 quid uh, for a week's work. Richie was used to working in tight circumstances and approached the shooting process with unprecedented attention to detail. The costume designer Stephanie Colley chose clothing that was only black, gray, or brown, and the set decorator Jack Hyman was told to stay away from props that were blue or yellow. In addition, the cameraman Tim Maurice Jones, who became Guy's faithful companion over the next 10 years, stocked up on sepia filters to lend the picture a retro gangster charm. Richie also convinced Jones to film in true clip style, focusing on things in the frame which looked cool, even if it was at the price of capturing the plot. Thanks to the preparation, by the time shooting started, the team was feeling relaxed, and the actors had the opportunity to dabble in the world of improv. The scene by the slot machines was improvised by Jason Fleming and Stephen Marcus, but the greatest discovery was the talent of Vinny Jones. While shooting the scene where he beats a man with a car door, they placed a piece of wood where the head should have been, and Guy asked Vinny to scare the shit out of the cameraman. That day, Jones succeeded in scaring every person on set. There were a few extraordinary moments that appeared thanks to dumb luck, like the scene where Ed forgot to bring the guns to the robbery, which happened because one of the prop managers forgot to bring them to the set. Have you forgot those guns, you dozy prep? The humorous relationship between Nick the Greek and the coffee table was also unplanned. But when Guy saw the shattered glass, he decided to leave the scene in the final edited version. But much of the film material was not so lucky. The final version did not include the backstory of the relationship between JD and Harry the Hatchet, as well as the plot line with Eddie's girlfriend, played by supermodel Claudia Schiffer. Her part was cut, due to negative reactions after pre-screenings. Jesus! Never saw you there. After that, they changed the finale also. In the first version, the foursome fled with the money, but was followed by Big Chris and his son. Cheeky bastard. But this ending was rejected by the focus group. According to legend, Richie and Nick Moran had a revelation and wrote down the new ending on a pack of cigarettes. Those scenes were filmed four months later, which is noticeable thanks to Tom's hat, which barely hides his outgrown hair, which the actor refused to cut. I wanted to talk to you about that. There's another important scene that cannot be left without attention. Oh, I want you here. Eddie getting up from the card table is a direct allusion to Martin Scorsese's Mean Streets. Also, the many layers of the plot are often compared to Pulp Fiction by Quentin Tarantino. Though Richie's film differs from Tarantino's masterpiece because the storylines are directly connected, as opposed to abstractly, and all lead to one finale. I don't believe this. What has happened there? Jesus. 
On the 23rd of August, 1998, the film was shown for the first time at the Edinburgh Film Festival and in five days premiered in British cinemas. In the first week, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels made one million pounds sterling. It was a smashing success and then made a successful tour around the world. However, not in the USA, where the film only appeared six months later. Matthew Vaughn hadn't been able to find a distributor in America until Trudy Styler invited a close friend to yet another pre-screening, Tom Cruise. It was hysterical. You had all these mid-level executives sitting there and Cruise walked in. He saw them all sit and pay attention, all getting on their phones and suddenly all these senior executives joined the screen. At the end, Tom got in front of everyone and said, this is the best movie I've seen in years. You guys would be fools not to buy it. This resulted in $4 million in profit in the States and $28 million in box offices worldwide. We have the chance to count it. The film also helped Richie in his personal life. The soundtrack impressed Madonna, who contacted Guy and Matthew to offer them the opportunity to release their disc on her record label to sell in America. Later, they were introduced to each other at a party at Sting's house. That was how one of the most famous couples of our century came into being. The romance developed just as quickly as Guy's career. He got more attention thanks to directing a clip of Bus Stop's remix of Carl Douglas's Kung Fu Fighting, which topped the British music charts. Come on. When everybody's Kung Fu Fighting. Come on. And after the incredible success of Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, there was a spin-off TV series that offered Richie a little cash on the side. He wrote the script for the pilot episode and sold the rights to use the characters and the original plot. Unfortunately, our story about his debut film has to end on a sad note. The film was dedicated to Lenny McLean, who played Barry the Baptist. The Baptist got his name by drowning people for hatching. Are you going to fucking fight? No, fight. Are you going to fucking fight? McLean died a month before the film's release on the big screen. While shooting, he thought that he had caught a cold. After he finished work on the film, he was diagnosed with pneumonia and admitted to a hospital. But it turned out to be inoperable lung cancer. Do you like our work? Let us know with your like and comment. Push that subscribe button and share with your friends. If you want to support the project financially, become our sponsor on Patreon or YouTube sponsorship. Thank you.